Yeah, Psalm 59. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <coughs> Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. See how they lie and wait for me. <coughs> Fierce men conspire against me for no offence or sin of mine, Lord. <coughs> oh, pardon me. <coughs> I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise and help me. Look on my plight. You, Lord God Almighty, you are the God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. They return at evening, snarling like dogs, and prowl about the city. See what they spew from their mouths. The words from their lips are sharp as swords, and they think, who can hear us? But you laugh at them, Lord. You scoff at all those nations. You are my strength. I watch for you, Lord. God... You, God, are my fortress, my God on whom I can rely. God will go before me and will let me gloat over those who slander me. But do not kill them, Lord, my, uh, our shield, or my people will forget in your might. Uh, in your might, uproot them and bring them down for the sins of their mouths, for the words of their mouth, lips. Uh, let them be caught in their pride. For the curses and lies they utter, consume them in your wrath. Consume them till they are no more. Then it will be known to the ends of the earth that God rules over Jacob. They return in the evening, snarling like dogs, and prowl about the city. They wander ab about for food and howl if not satisfied. But I will sing of your strength. In the morning I will sing of your love. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. You are my strength. I sing praises to you. You, God, are my fortress, my God, on whom I can rely. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it sure has been an interesting time these last two years. It's been the end of the world every day for the last two years. And uh, most times when we have a, a, a difficulty, it comes and you brace yourself and you, you get knocked over and you get back up and you strengthen yourself and you're ready to face the next thing. But this has been a continual thing with very little uh, abating and it looks like it may be set to continue. Uh, and it reminded me of what David was going through. He was under attack and it was a sustained attack and it was reaching a, a, a peak but there was more to come. Uh, this, uh, we don't always get the reasons why the Psalms were written, but we are told that there's a certain point where this was written. Right at the introduction there in the Psalm, it says, When Saul had sent men to watch David's house in order to kill him. Now up to this point, David has already escaped two attempted sparings from Saul. I have to be careful how I use that word. My New Zealand accent doesn't distinguish spare from spare. Um, but he was being attacked by javelins. That's better. There we go. Uh, he wasn't spared at all. He was, he was attacked by javelins. And uh, we read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife and Saul's daughter, warned him and said, if you don't run for your life tonight, you'll be killed. And so Michal let David down through a window, and he fled, and he escaped. Uh, we're going to look at this psalm about David on his own and having to rely on God. But I don't want you to forget that there were other players involved. Uh, David was saved initially because Michal helped him to escape. Throughout his life, God had provided Jonathan, a dear brother, who shared in the struggles and the joys of David and had his back. And uh, I want you to thank God for the people that have your back, for the people in your life that have your best in mind. And, and I can I encourage you to be those kinds of people for others. I want you to imagine what it must have been like for David. He had worked in the king's palace. He had saved the nation. Can you imagine what it must feel like? To be at the top of your game, lauded for your skills, doors open to you all over the place, invited to all sorts of exciting places, only to suddenly have authorities come after you and your freedom severely curtailed for no other reason really than that you were threatening the king's popularity. 
I was serving in the Middle East and we had some neighbours move in next door who were refugees from Iran. Uh, they were the first of a flood of refugees that were about to arrive into our city. And I went to see them and we got talking and they told me they were atheists. And I felt led to just share a little bit more openly about why I was there and I said I believe God had called me here and, and God has called me here to, to t tell people about Jesus. And uh, as I kind of gave a little bit about what I was there for, they kind of opened up a bit more and they told me that in fact they were Christians. And he, when he was in Iran, used to ride his bicycle around and throw Bibles and Jesus films over high fences into people's properties. And he got wind that he was in trouble and they were going to about to put him in, him in jail and his family. And so he got in the car, got their belongings and, and drove straight to the school where his children were, put them in the car and without telling them why, he just drove and they drove all the way to Turkey and uh, never went back. Uh, that's the kind of fear that David is under. Uh, for David, it wasn't just the danger that all these people were after him, but that it was being directed. Think of who was directing all this. It was directed by his near relative, his boss, the king, that, it's, that he'd served loyally and the leader of the land. Uh, this was the pain of true betrayal, the type you get when your own family won't see you or return your gifts. Uh, places you used to frequent and voluntarily serve are closed down to you as if you don't exist. Uh, David suddenly found himself on the altar from the very people that he had served. Uh, in these types of circumstances, you can do two things. You can get angry with God because you're not being treated fairly and actively, uh, or, or you can um, actively withdraw or passively withdraw, just kind of shut yourself off. Uh, but we mustn't forget that Jesus too was betrayed and not treated as he deserved. God understands. Uh, or you can turn to God. Instead of turning away from God, you can turn to God, believing that there is no other hope or help left. And it's not just that he's all you have, but he's the best you have. We've sung about that this morning. Not just your last, but your first port of call. Charles Spurgeon, a great speecher who uh, spoke in the uh, 19th century, he said this, God is too good to be unkind and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. When you are so weak that you cannot do much more than cry, you coin diamonds with both your eyes. The sweetest prayers God ever hears are the groans and sighs of those who have no hope in anything but his love. I've had the privilege of... Uh, of uh, being a pastor and having the opportunity to talk to people about their darkest moments when they face burdens that are too big for anyone to, to bear and often more than one at a time. Everyone around them either abandons them or is unable to help and they speak to me of when they've had to take a leap over the cliff into the, to the invisible at that stage arms of God because they've got nothing else left to lean on. And it is then that that God shows himself to be more present, more real than they've ever known. And sometimes you hear people say, uh, in contrast to that, you hear people say, oh, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone say that. Uh, well, that's baloney. That's not scriptural. Whoever said that hasn't really lived or ever talked to anyone deeply about what they've had to face in life. God won't give you more than you can handle? That's rubbish, says Paul, who directly contradicts that urban myth in one sentence. Let's, let me read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We were under great pressure, he says, far beyond our ability to endure. Far beyond, more than we could handle. So that we despaired of life itself. In other words, it would be easier to be dead. Indeed, we felt we'd received the sentence of death, he says. In other words, the only relief he could see was to die. And then he says this, But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hopes that he will continue to deliver us. So please learn from Paul and from David uh, if and when you're up against the wall with no way through, uh, David was faced with more than he could handle, but he didn't withdraw into himself. He doesn't get angry with God. He didn't blame God. He doesn't do something even worse than that and turn his back on God. 
he turns to God. His only hope for deliverance. And he cries out to him, verse 1, Deliver me, rescue me from my enemies, God. It's a great model. It's a model. That's why we have 150 Psalms. That's why we see even Jesus when he felt abandoned. He doesn't turn from God. He turns to God and says, why have you abandoned me? That's what you do. You turn to God. David was in a hopeless situation. He had a whole army after him and he was just one man. It wasn't just Saul, uh, it wasn't just Saul that was after him. Notice he says enemies. Trouble was coming from every side, separation from family, betrayal, hostility, loss of employment, imminent peril, and he's helpless. And he didn't leave his house as a, as a fine warrior uh, on a, a war horse or in a tank. He jumped out the window, maybe in his pajamas. He was defenseless. The things that he had really expected to provide him, his house, his family, his employer, his uniform protectors, his government had instead turned on him. And so David prays, be my fortress against those who are attacking me. And now stop there, that's a really good thought. When we're up against trouble, when we're in danger from the very ones meant to look after us, when there's difficulty all around us, when we feel inadequate, under threat, cornered, even then, we are not alone. We have the God of the universe. He holds back the seas. He limits the rain. He calms the winds. The God of creation, he will be our stronghold for us, a fortress, even for those who are defenseless, especially for them. He has a heart for those people. Now, the threat was real. They didn't just harass David. They wanted to finish him. David says, save me from those evildoers who are after my blood, verse 2. This wasn't just a random threat like being hit by lightning or, or being bitten by a snake. These predators were only interested in David. They were plotting against him and they were waiting for their moment to attack. And what's worse is that these men had been convinced to go after David for no good reason. David, David says it plainly. See what he says in verse 3. For no other sin, uh, for no offence or sin of mine, Lord, they're coming after me. And it wasn't that David was sinless, but he had no offence against the king. And yet these men had been told that he was a threat, that he was dangerous, that society would be better off without him. They made no inquiry. They accepted it all based on the lies of the king. David had been made the enemy and these men were the useful idiots carrying out the wicked wishes of the king, believing they were helping to make society a safer place. To achieve this kind of persecution of a harmless, innocent, indeed noble person, Saul couldn't do it by himself. He had to convince a whole lot of people to do the dirty work for him. Unlike Saul's daughter, Michal, or Saul's son, Jonathan, who really knew David and were not easily swayed, these men had been convinced that David was a menace, despite the obvious facts. And so David says in verse 4, I've done no wrong, yet they are, they are ready and willing to attack me. His homeland was arrayed against him, and David was in a perilous position. And he says, God, arise, look at my plight. David couldn't believe it. These men he had served alongside, these are men he had defended and saved. Uh, when he had taken on Goliath and the Philistines. These men had sent him faithfully serving and comforting the key king with his music. Uh, it would be like turning on Willie Nelson and calling him the threat of America. Uh, it was just, it was so, uh, it was so crazy. And, and David was not just fa facing the attack, but the betrayal of those he had served alongside. They were tormenting him now. And, and through the king and his cohorts were against him. And though that was all coming on him on every side, uh, David knew he could go above the king. He could go to the king of kings. God could go after those who were going after David. And in this case, unless God answered, David would be a goner. And so he says in verse 5, you, Lord God Almighty, you are the God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. And that's important for us, is it not? There are real threats to our physical, mental, emotional and spiritual well-being. We have people who don't have our best in mind. 
Uh, there are people who want to take advantage of us. There are also invisible threats. There are cancers and illnesses that could take us out. There are diseases that are so contagious that those closest to us might be the most dangerous. There are other things that can overwhelm us, our own sin and addictions, inner corruptions, and there are real spiritual attacks. And the devil and all his demons are prancing around like a roaring lion ready to devour. But in all these things we are not overcome because we know someone higher above all this. God is the King of Kings. He is the great healer that can heal anyone of anything. And even when we die, we will only be given a new body fit for eternity. Jesus is above all principalities and powers. So while at present we are weaker than the forces set against us, we can pray to someone who is above it all and in the name of someone who has been given all authority. It's, it's like those rare times when my children call me into their rooms and someone on the upper bunk is annoying someone on the lower bunk. They call on someone who's actually even taller than that and uh, he can deal with it. Uh, in a much greater way, God, that doesn't happen very often, by the way, um, in, a, in a much greater way, God can help us from those who, who are above us. And so in verse 6 and 7, we learn something else about these attacks. It wasn't just the size of the men arrayed against him. It wasn't just the traitorous betrayal of what was going on, but the intensity of the attacks. These weren't just policemen or soldiers impartially doing their duty. They'd been turned They'd been convinced that David was the real danger, that David was against them, that David was hazardous, indeed that they were unsafe if David was allowed to roam free. He needed to be hunted and locked up, locked down and destroyed. And David describes it as being surround, like being surrounded by a pack of dogs. And if you ever, when you see a dog bark at you, it's, it's not just the dog barks because he likes the sound of his own voice, well at least it's not just that, it's that he thinks you're a threat. He's looking after, he feels responsible for the family, for the property, and he sees you as a threat. I remember once a few weeks ago, I was walking to the, to the Martin's house, and I was walking along the, the, a, a, a stone road, and um, this dog started barking at me, and I looked, I looked at him, he was a big dog, and uh, fortunately there was this big fence, I thought, oh, that's right, there's a big fence there, I was almost going to do this to him, but... And then as I looked along the fence line, I noticed that the, the gates were open. And as the dog followed me, there was an opening. And, the, and I, I didn't know whether I should go back. or Anyway, I took the widest, the widest berth you could have imagined. I almost went into the neighbor's garden on the other side of the road to, to get past. This is what David felt, that, that same fear, that same sense of, of what was against him. David is no longer the king's loyal servant or their protector. He's now... Uh, a thief, a predator, a menace that needed to be eliminated. And, and they prowled the city on the hunt for David, making their intentions clear, snarling like dogs. They know they have him outnumbered, and they boast and they intimidate with such intensity that their words are vomited out. Their boast about what they're going to do and what's coming to David comes as swords to cut and to maim. And the dogs have got this. They're pretty sure they're going to get him. There's no escape for David. And if you help David, you get the same treatment. They've got the upper hand. Uh, Tim Keller reminds us that today's media, uh, these words about spewing words and, and coming as sharp as swords, uh, our media can do that so much effective, more effectively today. All media can do it. Unlike writing letters or reading newspapers, the threat comes thick and fast with bold headlines. Uh, we ourselves will dash emails and text messages off without weighing them. And unlike face-to-face -face confrontation, we blurt things out without fear, uh, fear of seeing the hurt or anger in another person's face. Things are misconstrued and amplified. And if you haven't already learned, social media is not a great medium for argument and even less for confrontation. Uh, David could hear all the shouts against him. But there's an interesting thing, the dogs shout, who can hear us? And you might think that's a bit contradictory. How can you spew and snarl and shout and yet think, who can hear us? Who's the who that's being talked about here? And I'm pretty sure that's a reference to God. They think they're invincible. They think the odds are set in their favour. They think that nothing can touch them. That they can live as they please without thought and reference to God. They've got the king's backing. 
They think they can do whatever they're going to do and nothing can come against them. It's as if God doesn't exist. Who can hear? Who's going to stop us? We're untouchable, they thought. Now you might have things arrayed against you. They might threaten you. They might not just want to fail, you to fail, but tip the scales in such a way that it's almost impossible not to fail. They just don't just wish bad things on you, but they do bad things, plotting and scheming to take you out. The devil rides on their back and amplifies the trouble, empowering them and making you cower. And all you can do is take it to God. And say like David in verse 7, see what they do, look at what they're up to. And how does God respond to the situation? Does he say, oh, I'm not interested or I'm busy? Or, yes, it's a real problem. I was hoping you would know how to fix it. Or does he say, whoa, I didn't realize it was that bad. I'm out of here. God doesn't do that. He does something surprising. He laughs. Not at you, but at them. He laughs because they think they're invincible. He laughs because they think they know how it will all work out. He laughs at their arrogance and he laughs at their confidence. Verse 8, David says, you laugh at them. He laughs because he sees. You remember the story of the Tower of Babel? Uh, these people brought the tall, built the tallest building that, that ever had existed. They marveled at what they were able to achieve. And in verse 5 of Genesis 11, it says, the Lord came down to see what they were up to. It's, in other words, in heaven, he could, it was hardly a blip. He thought, there's something happening there. I'll go down. And he had to go down to see what this thing was. It was so little. He had to go down to see what was going on. Uh, he laughs because he knows. There is no surprise. You can't ambush God. And he laughs because he's sovereign and he's powerful. Is the Lord's arm too short, Moses asks. God is so powerful and so sovereign that he can take what is meant for evil and use it for good. For so many people uh, who have brought their, deeper, the, the deepest and, and hardest difficulties to God, for those who have scars, God doesn't just heal, uh, and I know many of you can testify to this, he uses your very scars as one of the most effective tools of ministry to others and to the glory of God. As, as, as uh, it says in Genesis 50, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. But it's hard because we look around and we see all sorts of things arrayed against the gospel, arrayed against God's people. Uh, even this, this virus, there's, there's talk that it was made in a lab and accidentally released. Uh, there's, there's governments and pre premiers who are overreaching and others who are not doing enough. And, and we, we, we feel like there's... The, 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 who's in charge, we keep asking. And the media is trying to push us one way or the other, irrespective of truth, knowing that nothing sounds like fear. Uh, and, and the media tries to hurt us along with certain ideas that get promoted and other things that, that would be helpful are, are, are hidden. Uh, I feel it's as bad as it's ever been, but I was reading Winston Churchill, and he would, he would complain that the, the media, which had a, a bias towards Germany, they liked Germany before the war, that the media was quite quite favourable to German, to the German uh, movement. And they would uh, minimise the, the bad things and they would amplify the great things. Uh, and what about all these powerful forces working together? Uh, Ten years ago, the left was against big business. Do you remember the shut down Wall Street protests and all that? Uh, now, and, I, and, I, and you can array them, you've got, you've got big business, big tech, big pharma, the media, social media, political and social causes, and even the government, and they're all singing from the same book. I don't remember a time in history when everybody, all the big powers, were all on the same side. Uh, and then you've got the rise of China to worry about. Now, if you've got no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. Ignorance is bliss. Uh, and, and, and please be careful uh, about calling anything or everything a conspiracy, because most things that are called conspiracies are actually just stupidity and uh, incompetence. Uh, but for those of you who have noticed these things, it's easy to think that the bad guys have the upper hand, that the dominant powers are making everything worse, that good is being portrayed as bad and bad is being portrayed as good, that the world is going mad except for you and me, and I'm not even sure about you. Uh, but look at what God does. As you worry about all that and you look to that and you see probably more than you wish you'd seen, 
Lord, says David, you scoff at those nations. You scoff. In Psalm 2, David talks about how all the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain. The kings rise up and band against the Lord and against his anointed, the Lord Jesus. And they think they've got the victory. And and God's response in verse 4, he sits in heaven and he laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. David takes strength in that, that the Lord scoffs, because he knows how it ends. And so it means that whatever is arrayed against you, whether it be obvious as a slap in the face or whispering behind your back, whether it be bold schemes of big organisations or even the hidden things of a deep state, whether it be the demonic, demon, bon, demonic, uh, blah, 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 demonic co- coordination of bad actors or the damage of sheer incompetence, rem- remember this and hear it well. God is never surprised, never rattled, never reeling, never thrown, never overwhelmed, never worried. No matter what news you receive, God heard it before you. He knew it was coming. And so if God is not slapping his forehead with shock, wondering how this could have happened, then we don't have to either. If God is so comfortable that he can laugh, uh, we can have comfort in that. And so at the heart of the psalm in verses 9 and 10, David remembers the God he knows. And he begins by declaring that his strength was in God, or even that God was his strength. That where, that's where he's enabled to go on. His strength was not in himself, but in another person, the Lord his God. And this same God, verse 9, was his fortress. So God provided for him, but also protected him. And because of this, David would watch for his God. He'd be looking to see what God would do and what God was doing and what God wanted. You are my strength. I watch for you, God. You are my fortress. Some of us look at the stock market, others the COVID numbers, some the letterbox, some emails and others social media, looking, looking for for hope. Uh, Others the news. And we check all these things, hoping that we'll pick up signs of improvement or signs that we're turning a corner. And sometimes these things turn in the right direction, but much of it is cyclical and ultimately disappointing. I don't know if it's a good time for any of these things at the moment, but David's eyes were elsewhere. He was looking for his God for the simple reason that when you believe in an eternal God, that God is sovereign, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, then there is only one horse worth backing, if you're a gambler. Um, You can say with David, you are my God on whom I can rely. And David goes on to trust that he will get the last laugh, that whatever evil is arrayed against him, God will go before me and will let me gloat over those who slander me. I will tell you um, not to be ruled by fear, Because there's nothing to fear. I'm sorry, I'm telling you not to be ruled by fear, not because there's nothing to fear or that no one's going to get hurt. I tell you not to be ruled by fear because the love of God drives out fear. That there's something bigger than all the worries that plague this world, real or imagined. That even if you die, Jesus has taken out the sting of fear and we as God's children are no longer to be ruled by fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. This is not triumphalism that has taken hold of much of the church. That if you speak boldly enough, if you tell God what's what, then since you're a king's kid, then God is beholden to your great faith. That's not a biblical idea. Our boast is not based on ourselves, but on our God. Our confidence is not that nothing bad will ever happen to us, but that God is sovereign and he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him. And so in verse 11, David asks God to humiliate them, but not to wipe them out, because people quickly forget when God delivers us, we we take it for granted. And sometimes when God removes these things, we get cocky and forget the threat. Uh, And yet, by verse 13, uh, even with that initial thought, he realises they need to be taken out, and he says, consume them in your wrath, consume them till they are no more. And you might think this is, Uh, This kind of talk is unbefitting for a man of God, that it almost sounds like revenge and vindictiveness. But when you have people literally trying to take you out, when you see oppressors 
crushing or just taking advantage of the vulnerable and the needy. When you see children being taken advantage of and being persuaded to turn down dark paths, when you feel the terror and the threat of what is evil and, and, and see what evil does, and, and if you're not stirred by that, you're not human, you're not one of God's children, God hates that. And these type of psalms take a fresh relevance in this time. But more than that, David reveals his main goal in verse 13. The main reason he wants his perilous enemy taken out spectacularly is that it will be known all over the earth that God rules. He wants God to be glorified. That's his, that's his, his goal. And so David is lifted out of his fear and despair by focusing on God. The very real and present threat, though, comes back and flashes before his eyes again. And he goes back to his, his worries. We see it in verse 14. He goes back to talking about these dogs that are all around. Uh, he was looking to God and then he sees the waves. And uh, this time he, he's, he's focused on the, the, their, their goal. They wander about for food and hell if not satisfied. Now faith is now faced with a choice. He can obsess about the real dangers about him. Or he can look up and take hold of his God in this precarious situation. And we're often good the first time something bad happens. We respond rightly and we deal with it and we feel better. And then we get hit with a second wave and it's a second wave that knocks us over. David's in that same situation. Much like Peter who by looking to Jesus could walk on water and then when he focused on the waves he began to sink. We are daily faced with the same choice. Chaos. Or creator, who's going to be our focus? Who's going to be the one we focus on? And so David declares his choice where his thoughts will reside in verse 16. I will sing of your strength in the morning. I will sing of, I'll start the day with you and I'll be singing of you. I will sing of your love for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. Uh, as we sing in one of our songs, when all things that surround me become shadows in the light of you. Uh, this whole psalm reminds me of the 23rd psalm where David says, in the presence of my enemies, you remember what God did in the presence of my enemies? God prepares a banquet. Uh, God prepares a banquet for us in the middle of our turmoil. Notice how three times in this psalm David uses the word sing. You are my strength, I will sing praise to you. You are my God on whom I, I rely. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing. You can't just think internally when you sing. You have to vocalize it. You have to declare something. There's courage in singing. There is defiance, defiance in singing. God's people even dare to sing at funerals. We don't sing at this church just for a change of pace or to have a break from other activities or just to teach some theological ideas. I hope you notice that the songs are chosen deliberately. We're intentional when we sing. Sometimes we declare, other times we marvel. There are songs of prayer that we pray straight to God himself. And as we do all this, our minds are moved and focused on our great God and his mighty acts. You can see those dogs around you, including the ones that come through your screens, and you talk back. And you say, you can snarl, but I'll sing. You can attack me, but I'll look to God and I'll sing of him. And I hope you're intentional when you sing, not half-hearted or held back. I hope you take time in your own devotions to sing and speak words out loud. Get yourself an old hymn book and, and, and read one of the hymns of the faith out loud as part of your morning preparation. Some of their tunes are awful from the really old ones, but the words are marvellous. Get one and, and, and make it part of your devotions. If it's got a nice tune, sing it as well. Uh, singing is spiritual warfare. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee far away. In the mighty name of Jesus, tell who can stand before us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have the victory. And so I want to finish just by reading something that Martin Isles wrote. Uh, he's, he's often able to see what's happening and says it first before everyone else says it. And he, I just saw that this this week. And uh, he's supposed to be on holiday, so I don't know what he's doing. But anyway, he said this. He said, everywhere I look, there is insecurity, anxiety, and fear. I can't believe how many are in the grip of this misery. But then if it were all up to me, I might fear too. 
If the world was a random incoherence of chance events in time and space, if it was all up to me to dodge the troubles and find the safe paths, I think I'd struggle, and often. But this is not so. The world is under control. And the one who controls the world knows my name. He has written it down for safekeeping. And as he controls the world, he does so without forgetting me or you. The true Christian lives with this unshakable certainty and it changes everything. They have a quietness and a confidence about tomorrow because tomorrow is in better hands than theirs. It seems to me that this witness to a stressed out world, a witness of peace, could become one of the strongest witnesses a Christian can have. It's not like this fearfulness is going away. Our society was descending into a growing vortex of depression and anxiety before COVID even came along. But I am concerned that this fearfulness has knocked too many of us around. If you have lost this peace, then you have lost your way. God says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder of this psalm. Though the enemy and the opposition is real, above that, you, the great, unchangeable, all-seen, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. We know that you keep in perfect peace those whose mind is set on you, because to trust in you is to trust in the one who is above all and over all. And we thank you, Lord, that these are your things to work out. And we thank you for the great privilege of being used by that. Lord, we pray for a peace that surpasses understanding, not that we don't get anxious, but we bring our anxiety to you and your, your peace by your spirit floods us. And Lord, help that to overflow, that we might also be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.